Welcome back to another installment in the Beyond Addiction series. My name is Adrian Webster, and in this uh, particular lecture, I would like to take you on a, a continued journey into the world of the illegal drugs, seeing how they affect us and how they work, what the risk factors are. We began this subsection in the broader Beyond Addiction series with our very last segment, which looked at the prescription drugs and the cocaine and the ecstasy. In this particular section, we're continuing that subject entitled Chemical Weapons, Identifying the Enemy. And in part two, our very first category of drugs that we want to look at are none other than the hallucinogens. Now, the hallucinogen name sounds a lot like another, uh, another word in the English dictionary. What is that? Hallucination. So the hallucinogenic drugs are going to be characterized by the properties of hallucination. We get three broad categories of hallucinogens. The first one is the psychedelics, and this is the category that probably most people are thinking about when they talk about um, you know, hallucinogenic drugs. This is where the most commonly abused drugs and used drugs are categorized. For instance, the marijuana, the LSD, mescaline, which is found in the peyote cactus used by uh, the North American Indians uh, in their rituals and so on, much like uh, in the rest of the world, the Rastafarians may use their, their blessed herb, as they call it, the marijuana, uh, in their religious ceremonies and so on. Then you get psilocybin and psilocin, which are the active ingredients in magic mushrooms, and then the little morning glory seeds, which have seeds which have psychedelic properties. And then our second category is the dissociatives, a drug there known as PCP or angel dust, very, very bad reputation for causing aggressive behavior and so on. Ketamine, which is actually an anesthetic, sometimes has in times gone by been used on people or even by veterinarians on animals, uh, a very powerful anesthetic, but you know the side effect is these hallucinogenic properties. So when a person's coming up out of anesthesia, they may begin to see things and hear things which can be sometimes very disturbing. Then we have salvia divinorum, which is a type of plant. Then in the deliriant category, we have Benadryl, and also Dramamine, known as Gravol, which are medications. Medications are drugs, drugs are medications. We have Deadly Nightshade, Hendrake, Henbane, Datura. These are plants which you will know from if you ever were into watching these medieval type movies or reading those books in which there's an apothecary that needs to cast spells or drug a person. You will know that they will use, for, use Deadly Nightshade or Mandrake or something like that. And now you understand why. It's part of the hallucinogenic family, but it's in a subcategory known as delirians. And the dissociatives and the delirians describe very clearly what these characteristics are going to do. Well, dissociatives, they're going to make you dissociate yourself from reality. Delirians are going to make you delirious, confused, not sure where you are or who you are or what's going on. Uh, the dissociatives and the delirians can be very dangerous. The delirians especially can cause death. But the psychedelics will usually not cause death. They may cause mental instability. They may land you up in some sort of mental asylum because of the negative psychoactive properties that they have on the mind. But uh, usually not too dangerous from a physical overdose perspective. And this is really what we want to talk about. We want to talk about the psychedelic category of the broader hallucinogenic family. So here's a little definition for us. Hallucinogens, and referring in particular to the psychedelics, are psychoactive substances. Okay, pause there a moment. What is psychoactive? Well, psycho has to do with the brain. Active has to do with stimulation. So these are substances which react on a psychological level, on a mental level, more so than on a physiological level. Yes, there are physiological effects, but uh, people who take them like them usually because they enjoy the effect of the hallucinations or the mind games that are played when uh, on these substances. So, psychedelics are psychoactive substances that powerfully alter perception, the way I see the world around me, mood, up or down, and a host of cognitive processes cognitive having to do with the thought process. 
So it's going to change the way I think, the way I see the world around me, and therefore the way I interact with that world is going to change as well. This can be potentially, of course, very dangerous. If I perceive someone in my circle of friends suddenly to be against me while I'm high on this drug, I may take evasive action or offensive action to protect myself from the perceived threat. So we want to be very careful if we're going to be playing with these drugs. The first one on our list to study a little bit about is cannabis. The active ingredient in cannabis is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. You can see where cannabis gets its name from the last part of that very long word, cannabinol, cannabis. We are going to abbreviate delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol by just calling it THC as we go further. So that's the active ingredient in cannabis. Pet names for cannabis is obviously hashish. In fact, hashish is, you can see on the screen there, that, so that, uh, that solid cake of resin, the uh, extracted resin from the plant, which is, uh, can be ground up at a later stage, put on normal cigarettes or anything else that's being smoked. So that is hashish. But uh, cannabis is also known as ganja, or as weed, or as pot, or as grass, or by a number of other names, depending on where it's grown and what its quality and what its properties are. You get Malawi gold and you get Swazi and you get all sorts of different types of, uh, and different grades of the cannabis plant that's used recreationally. Methods of administration. Well, cannabis can be smoked, inhaled into the lungs. This is obviously the uh, method of administration that is most commonly associated with this drug. We all know about smoking the chalice or the bong or the pipe or the joints or whatever it is. It can also be made into a tea, an infusion, but relatively inefficient in this form. It may also be used in baking experience, making cakes or cookies. And so sometimes uh, you will hear or you will see on the news or in the newspaper uh, an incident where somebody has taken some cakes and cookies to school and they shared it with their friends and their teacher and, well, uh, some strange things happened after that because it can be built into or baked into some of these foodstuffs. Vaporization is a method that's very seldom used. It requires specialized equipment whereby the substance is heated to a very high temperature, 180 degrees to 200 degrees centigrade. And then what is emitted is not so much a smoke as it is the THC fumes, again, inhaled into the lungs and travels to the, to, to the brain through the bloodstream. Active dosage is as little as 2 to 3 milligrams. Very difficult to even measure that amount. Uh, so that is the amount that will be felt in the human body, 2 to 3 milligrams. But just park that value in the back of your mind somewhere. When we talk about LSD in a few moments, we're going to talk about the active dosage for LSD, and we can compare these to get an, uh, an idea of how powerful LSD is. And yes, drugs are medications. Medications are drugs. Did you know that cannabis in some countries, there's a lot of controversy around this, of course, but in some countries, the government legislates that a certain number of plants may be grown for personal use if a medical certificate is present. Uh, you know, four or five or six plants or whatever the permission is not to be bought, not to be sold, not to be shared in any other way for medicinal purposes. In the case of analgesia, the need to kill off pain. In the case of movement disorders, such as multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease whereby the, the immune cells of the body actually attack the nerves in the spinal column, and uh, this causes a little ulceration that takes place there, a very painful experience. Uh, it comes and it goes as these attacks occur, a little bit like mouth ulcers inside of someone's mouth. But of course, as those, as those sores heal on those neural pathways, they cause scar tissue, which hinders the transmission of nerve impulses, resulting in a movement disorder, because the brain cannot communicate with the rest of the body parts as to how they ought to, uh, ought to respond to the cognitive process. So in those cases, sometimes cannabis is allowed and prescribed for medicinal purposes. Very controversial, of course. How does cannabis work inside the brain? This is a very interesting study. It's one of the more complex, so you're going to have to think about this a little bit. You've survived our discussion on caffeine and tobacco and alcohol and all the rest of uh, all the previous illegal drugs. Now, now, just lend me your mind again as we talk about the neurobiology of how cannabis actually works. It's very interesting once you understand it because it explains the behavior patterns and the thought processes of those who you know have been using cannabis for a long time. If you are using it, you will also begin to understand why certain ways of thinking and habits and patterns of behavior are coming into your experience. 
So, the THC binds to cannabinoid receptors in the brain. Remember what we said many lectures ago, that in order for a drug to work in your system, there has to be a God-given system with a God-given neurotransmitter that acts in a similar way to the drug chemical that we, that we take into our system. The drug chemical t comes in, it hijacks the God-given system, it uses and abuses it, and discards it. So you have a canna cannabis-type neurotransmitter in your brain. It's called anandamide. Okay, anandamide binds to cannabinoid receptors under normal circumstances. And what this stuff does is it's a very widespread network inside the brain of cannabinoid receptors. And anandamide binds to this widespread network, and it actually is like the brakes on your car. When, it bi when anandamide binds to cannabinoid receptors, it gives them a little hug for a short period of time and lets go. And the result of that hug is felt as fatigue or tiredness as it slows the brain down. It reduces the excitability of the neurons with cannabinoid receptors. Are you with me so far? Now we smoke THC. THC interferes with the role of anandamide. It mimics anandamide. It binds to those cannabinoid receptors. Those cannabinoid, cannabinoid receptors is such a wide network, it helps regulate mood, memory, appetite, pain, cognition, the thought process, and your emotions because it's so widespread throughout the brain. So this is why when you're using the substance, the whole of the human experience is distorted. Anandamide, as we said, short, brief hug, slows the brain down, reduces excitability, lets go, and the brain continues like normal. THC comes, binds to the same receptors as anandamide, only it gives it a big, great old bear hug and doesn't want to let go quickly. And so you get major reduction in the excitability of the brain. Everything sort of slows down. So when the THC binds to CB1 receptors, less neurotransmitters are released in the cascade effect, and so general excitability of the brain is reduced dramatically. However, the dopaminergic neurons, dopaminergic, you remember when you have that ergic suffix to a transmitter name, these are the neurons that are releasing and utilizing that particular particular uh, neurotransmitter. So dopaminergic neurons, neurons that are reacting to, releasing, and so on, uh, this substance called dopamine. The dopaminergic neurons in the brain do not have CB1 receptors. They do not have cannabinoid receptors. So the THC cannot slow down the release of this neurotransmitter dopamine. The way the dopamine neurons get the message to slow down the release of, dop of dopamine is very simple. They have GABA receptors, gamma amino bituric acid. So in the rest of the brain, slowed down by anandamide. In the dopamine center of the brain, that area is slowed down and reduced, the excitability is reduced through GABA. Now, think about this. The neurons that release GABA that tell the dopamine to slow down, those neurons releasing the GABA, they have cannabinoid receptors. They react to anandamide. Are you with us? So when I smoke my THC, it gets into the system. It tells the whole brain to slow down dramatically, and it tells the neurons that release GABA, which is supposed to slow down dopamine, that they must stop releasing GABA. So if GABA is the brakes for the dopamine system, and I've just told, I've just put the brakes on the brakes, in other words, I'm releasing less GABA, then it sends the opposite message to the dopamine neurons that, guess what? I must release more dopamine, because there's no more braking system for the dopamine. The, the the THC has put the braking on the GABA system. The GABA, therefore, cannot put the brakes on the dopamine system. So while the whole brain goes into slow mode, the dopamine system is getting really excited, on the other hand. Lots of dopamine release, lots of excitability. So I get real dumb, real stupid, but I feel great. And there are a lot of people in this world who like to get dumbed down while at the same time feeling great. So the THC removes the inhibitory effect of the GABA on the dopaminergic neurons and thus activates the dopamine production and release. So the result from a physiological perspective is euphoria, relaxation, because everything's gone into slow motion. We have drowsiness. We intensify the sensory experiences through the release of the dopamine, etc. We have uncontrolled laughter. Not quite sure what's going on, but it sure is funny. We have talkativeness. We have dry mouth 
and throat syndrome. We have bloodshot eyes. We increase in appetite. It's called the munchies. When you start eating, you just can't stop. One of the few drugs that will actually stimulate your appetite. So you could get overweight if you smoke too much THC. It also increases blood pressure and it'll increase your heart rate by 20 to 50% for the first three hours. Now think about this, that's hard work on the cardiovascular system. It will also damage the respiratory system, causing chronic bronchitis and even possible respiratory cancer development. All the risks that apply to cigarette smoking will also apply to the cannabis smoking. Now think about this. We'll just talk about the moving away from the neurobiology, talking about the cardiovascular system. If you know someone that's a chronic user, in other words, an ongoing user of marijuana, they smoke more often than every three hours. And it takes about three hours for the heart rate to decrease to normal. For that period, it's 20 to 50% higher. The blood pressure is higher. We're damaging the breathing apparatus. So the cardiovascular system takes serious strain through the use of cannabis. Do you think that over a period of years, while you're young, you may not feel that, but as you get older, this abuse of the cardiovascular system may pay off in disease conditions and shorter lifespan? You bet, it sure will. From a psychological perspective, cannabis causes illusions as differentiated uh, from uh, hallucinations. Hallucination is when I see something that's completely not there. If I saw a bunch of uh, pink bunnies running around here all of a sudden, they don't exist, that would be a hallucination. But if I looked at the wall and I saw the wall ripple or breathing, or I was looking at your face and it morphed out of shape, well, that would be an illusion. So typically with this drug, there's not so much hallucination properties as there are illusion properties. Time distortion is nothing other than an illusion in the realm of time. So I'm sitting somewhere for 15 minutes, it feels like three hours. Or I have been sitting somewhere for three hours, I look at my watch, it's, it, and it feels like 15 minutes. Okay? It impairs short-term memory and attention because that anandamide system, the cannabinoid receptors are all over the brain, including memory, and so I have a problem remembering things because everything is being deregulated and destimulated, so I'm unable to get good memory recall. We therefore get impairment of reaction time and skilled activities. I can see something happening, but it takes a while to register and to figure out how I should respond, and by that time, the accident has happened. So a bad drug to be driving your car around on. It increases the risk of psychosis. Psychosis is a state of paranoia in which we think everybody's out to get us, we can't trust anyone. Well, cannabis will feed that tendency. It causes long-term cognitive impairment in the area of memory, in the area of paying attention, in the area of organization and integration of complex information. So if you're hoping to be an engineer one day or a doctor where you're going to have to make decisions, where you're going to have to study hard, this is not the drug for you. If you're going to go into the exam room and smoke your marijuana joint outside a little while before because you're nervous, yes, it's going to definitely relax you because it's going to put your whole brain in slow motion. But don't think you're going to get much done in the exam. It's going to also impair your memory recallability. So all that's going to happen is you are going to fail in style. You're going to go down feeling great, but you're probably going to seriously impair your ability to do well at school, to do well at university, to do something with your brain. And then, of course, it has spiritual side effects as well. We note here a statement that cannabis has an ancient history of ritual usage as a trance-inducing drug in and is found in pharmacological cults around the, wall, around the world. A cult, some sort of religious experience, pharmacological, a religious experience which uses substances to create altered states of consciousness to bridge the gap between the physical and the spiritual world. So there are pharmacological cults, religious experiences around the world that will use different types of chemicals. As I say, in North, America, uh, North American Indians and shamanism, they may use uh, uh, something like mescaline from the peyote cactus. So we'll come back to this concept when we talk about LSD. On the screen you see cannabis seeds and of course a ripe head of cannabis ready uh, for plucking. Lysergic acid diethyl amide, LSD, my personal drug of choice from the bad old days when I was involved in this drug world. It's known as A, it's known as acid, it's known as LSD, or various different names according to the image that you see there on the blotting paper. So one would be called Hoffman's, and something else would be called Yin Yang's, and something else would be called Beavis's, but it depends what the image is. Uh, and of course those are different doses, and so each of those different types of LSD, so to speak, uh, have different reputation for the intensity of effect. Let's look at a brief history of how this drug came into existence and then you decide for yourself whether this is a safe one to play with. Well, it was invented by a, a chemist by the name of uh, Albert Hoffman. Uh, this is a picture of him in 1993. 
and uh, it was discovered in 1938. He was doing some experimentation for a, for a drug company, looking for some cures to some problems, and he discarded this initially because it wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing. Well, he uh, discovered quite accidentally the psychoactive effects of it when he got some on his skin while uh, moving it around in his laboratory, and before you knew it, he was uh, high as a kite, so to speak. Well, he noticed, and as he shared the symptoms of the drug high with his, his psychiatric uh, doctor friends and so on, they began to realize that the symptoms exhibited when high on this drug were very similar to the symptoms that were brought to light by their patients that they were seeking to treat for schizophrenia. So some of these medical professionals started messing with this drug, taking it to gain a subjective experience of what the schizophrenic goes through so that they would be better able to help them. So who would like a little bit of schizophrenia for Saturday night entertainment? You see, if, 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 the, if the medical prof professionals are seeing a similarity in the profile of effects with that of schizophrenia, and no one wants schizophrenia for fun, most people are seeking a cure from it, then why do we go and take a substance that gives us the same symptoms? It doesn't make any sense. Well, it went further from there. The CIA, Central Intelligence Agency of the United States of America, discovered that it may have some potential as a mind control substance. Why bomb the daylights out of your enemies if you can open them up to in a state of suggestibility by which you can control their thinking and reprogram their thinking so that they would become your allies and do your bidding? And so they began experimenting with this. This was leaked to the public. There was major public outcry, and so a stop was put to this project. It was known as Project uh, MK Ultra, and you can look at up and study it for yourself. Then, of course, it hit the streets in the 1960s. In the hippie movement, it was uh, legal for almost a decade. It was not yet outlawed until towards the end of the 60s when they began to see the negative effects and the fallout of the substance. They realized it was dangerous. They put a lid on it, scheduled it, and it became a controlled substance. Now you can see a guy who's high on LSD. You can see he's out touring the universe in his imagination. He is really not with it at all. He's in another place altogether. How does LSD work neurobiologically, very interestingly? Well, it works on most of the serotonin receptor subtypes. It also works on the dopamine receptor subtypes, and it also works on all the adrenoreceptor subtypes. So when we talk about dopamine, we're talking about pleasure and euphoria, mood and so on. When we talk about serotonin, we're also talking about mood, but we're talking about messing with the perceptual faculties of our mind. So serotonin helps us differentiate between sight and sound and the sensory input and make sense of it all. We cause a short circuit there, and that may be why we have the hallucinogenic properties uh, associated with LSD. So uh, then, of course, the adrenaline receptor subtypes, what does that mean? If it stimulates those areas, it's going to give the sense and the illusion of energy uh, and of wakefulness, cannot sleep when you're high on LSD. So yeah, we have an interesting co uh, combination. We have a chemical that messes with serotonin and the perceptual systems. It messes with the dopamine, creating euphoria and physical pleasurable pleasure sensations, and it messes with the adrenoreceptor subtypes, giving us a sense of energy and, uh, and wakefulness. And so, of course, you can understand why this drug is abused the way it is. So it mimics serotonin. It's very similar in structure to the serotonin molecule, but not quite the same. So it does a partial job of mimicking, but it short circuits the brain, and we end up with a problem. So the effects, euphoria, dilated pupils, increased body temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure, a theme that goes through all the drugs. We will find sweating, loss of appetite, by the way, because of the illusion effect, very difficult to eat something that wants to talk to you. Very difficult to eat something that looks like it's moving on your plate. It causes illusions when you're looking at these things, and of course it does genuinely suppress appetite. Causes sleeplessness, dry mouth and jaw clenching. It causes the shakes or tremors. And then from a psychological uh, perspective, a very dangerous drug. You know, this is a drug which has variable effects depending on uh, the individual state of mind, the environmental settings, who they're with, whether they feel comfortable, whether any sort of surprise changes happen in their environmental factors. A a as quickly, as great as it can be in the positive good trip sense, it can also very quickly cause uh, bad trips. It causes the sensation of illusions, just like with marijuana previously, and, uh, and of course, the good trip, bad trip scenario, as we were saying. So one minute I'm happy and I'm enjoying it, 
it and I'm euphoric. Next minute, environmental factor changes that I didn't bet on. Uh, somebody walks into the room. I don't know what's going on. I become confused. I become anxious. I become paranoid. And I completely freak out in a state of anxiety. I've had a few of those friends and it is not a good place to be. It can also cause flashbacks whereby many years later some sort of trigger goes off in your environment, some sort of music, song, a memory, and you actually may flip out for a little moment back to that place even though you haven't taken the substance. It may also trigger psychosis, a state of paranoia where you think the whole world is out to get you. And most importantly, as I was saying with marijuana, my big concern with the hallucinogenic family of drugs is not the risk of physical overdose, of physical death. You'd have to take massive amounts of these drugs to actually physically overdose. But my main concern here is that LSD and cannabis and the hallucinogenic drugs are drugs which are regarded as rel a religious sacrament or a powerful tool to access the divine being. Many books have been written comparing the LSD trip to the state of enlightenment of Eastern philosophy. Uh, I'm worried about it because these drugs cause psychoactive reactions inside of the brain that place a person in a state of suggestibility, in an altered state of consciousness. Now, if you know anything about occultic type religion and magic and all the rest, you know that integral to these experiences, including ancient pagan rituals and religions like tribal religion out of Africa, out of South America, out of North America, such as shamanism and, and out of uh, Eastern cultures and so on. You know that altered state of consciousness are very important to bridge the, the gap between the so-called physical world and the so-called spiritual world. That the spiritual world needs to intersect the physical world through an altered state of consciousness, which is really a state of open suggestibility. Sometimes we accomplish that through transcendental medica meditation. Sometimes we do it through tribal rhythms and dancing and, and music and so on. At other times we do it through chemical induction, like in a Western society where we like to pop a pill to solve all our problems. We alter our state of consciousness with one problem, uh, one additional problem when it comes to the chemical way of altering a state of consciousness. Because it's chemically induced, you can't just shut the door if you encounter something you don't like. My, the big risk in my mind associated with these drugs is the spiritual risk. It's the fact that we open our mind up to suggestibility and, and we don't know what spiritual realities we're going to encounter. We get away with it a few times, but eventually we get to a point maybe where we encounter the dark side of the spiritual world. What happens when you've thrown the door open chemically and you cannot just shut it again? You don't want to go there, but you're already there. You're in the state of suggestibility, an altered state of consciousness. And now what? You see, there are serious spiritual risks. We were talking about the active dosage of, 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 uh, of marijuana, 2 to 3 milligrams. Well, with LSD, it's 100 to 500 micrograms. I mean, that, is, uh, that makes it one of the most powerful psychoactive substances known to man. And we are playing with this stuff as if it's child's play. We are opening our minds up to a state of suggestibility where anything and everything could happen and we won't be able to shut the door. I plead with you, if you are playing with these drugs, turn your back on these substances. They are not your friends. They're not going to help you spiritually. The bottom line, friends, is as follows. There is a battle in this world for your mind. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. We wrestle against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In this battle for your mind between Christ and Satan, between the powers of good and the powers of evil, you are the one through your vote, through your exercise of free choice, that chooses who wins the battle in your particular case. They are warring over your mind. And when we open ourselves up to the state of suggestibility, we are giving the devil a foothold in our mind, a foothold in our life, which we may not be able to close as easily as we opened it up. I plead with you in the spiritual warfare that's going on around us, do not do anything that compromises your freedom of choice. Do not do anything that places your mind in the control of another. Do not do anything that would risk you opening yourself up to the spirit world and being, being harmed through that experience. Give your mind to Christ that he may protect you. Through an act of choice, walk away from this world, walk away from that way of doing things and give your mind to Christ. Let him secure it for you in this battle for your soul and for your mind. Indeed, a spiritual battle rages and you are the one who chooses who wins in your particular case. May God bless you as you make intelligent spiritual decisions. And may I share a word of prayer with you. 
Heavenly Father, will you protect the viewer? Will you protect their mind and their soul from the onslaughts of the enemy of souls? Will you protect them from this battle that rages? And will you help them to make a full surrender to you that indeed their eternal destiny may be secure in you forever? We thank you for your goodness and for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.